a handsaw, right? What's there to know? You pick it up, you take it to the wood, you go back and forth. Well, let me tell you, Ron Herman presented on Western Handsaws at Woodworking America, and he's forgotten more about saws than I'll ever know. Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker. This is episode number 69, dude! Sorry, I had to do that. I mean, come on. It took me 69 episodes to get here. I'm at least allowed to do that once. All right, anyway, let's get back to our recap of Woodworking in America's Hand Tools and Techniques Conference. The Western Hand Sawing Seminar presented by Ron Herman was one that I admit I didn't really know what to expect because at the same time we had Mike Winslow talking about saw sharpening. So I figured this is all going to be about usage and maybe some talk of the various types of saws and when to use them and things like that. Well, you know, I was partly right. What I didn't expect was Ron Herman. I admit coming into this having no idea who Ron Herman is and it, it, he blew my mind. This is a gentleman who is a restoration carpenter. Um, he does house building and house restoration um, period homes using nothing but traditional techniques. So when you talk about having a nest of saws or just, you know, I've got a bunch of saws, you've got nothing on Ron Herman. This man has more saws than, uh, I think, the national debt. So he... Very, very funny guy, very enthusiastic guy, very passionate about what he does, and knows a great deal about saws. Um, just so that I can set the stage right, and many of you probably already saw this uh, when I was posting videos from the conference to YouTube, but take a look at this short clip I took from my iPhone, just to give you some perspective on the number of saws that Ron has with him. And again, these are the saws, just the saws, that he brought with him to the conference. This, as I talked to him later, he said is only about a quarter of the total saws that he has in working condition. He says he's got stacks of saws that are not tuned up and restored that could fill whole rooms. Take a look at this clip. became obvious that Ron was a guy who knew his saws. I also began to understand that Ron spent some time teaching a lot about saws, how they work, how to sharpen them, all that stuff. And he had a lot of visual aids, which was kind of neat, some large scale teeth patterns and, and was able to really demonstrate how a saw actually works. And I think a lot of us are aware of how a, a rip saw cuts like a chisel and how a crosscut saw will slice the fibers a little bit more. But bringing out these big visual aids, and I'll show you that to you in a clip in a little bit, was really helpful, I think, to, to get a feel for that. Um, what was really interesting in, in his seminar was he brought with him a lot of different saws and passed them around the room. We got to see everything from a you know 28 inch rip tooth Distin D8 down to the tiniest of tiny keyhole saws, um, original bow saws, um, all kinds of crazy oddballs as well. It was really great to have him pass those around and tell us traditionally this is what it was used for. And you quickly began to realize that a true Sawyer has a saw for every type of wood, every thickness of wood, and every project out there to the point where Ron would talk about actually changing saws in mid-cut depending on how the wood is behaving say the grain switches direction and goes another way, he would actually change saws. Now, you know, not all of us are going to have 40, 50, 60 saws in our shop, but I think the key is his understanding that sawing, or excuse me, filing technique and tooth shape will actually help the saw cut better in different types of wood. Shelf that thought, and we'll get back to that when I talk about Mike Winsloff's discussion later on in a, in a future episode. So let me show you this clip of Ron and his visual aids. It has an edge here that actually does the cut, you know, more different than the chisel. This is the back of the tooth. There is no thing we, you know, we call flame or an angle and such. Each tooth as it bangs down, 
acts just like a chisel as it bangs through the wood. When you get the sawdust, you look at it, it should appear to be little pellets. You know, you can roll them in your fingers. I can tell real quick just by putting my hand under while you're working and whether or not you're running a cross cutter or it isn't hard to come up with that. Everybody understand how a rip tooth is, is configured? We'll get a little bit into sharpening, but Mike's doing most of that. When it comes to a cross cut, we'll use a peg tooth first. Right, imagine this being our direction of cut. This is a really high tooth called a peg tooth. We now have a, a second angle on it called a fleam, which is actually the cutting. I don't like the word bevel to it, um, for the fact that the back has a bevel. Fleam is actually the point that's made by the file in order to be the cutting edge. It's an old term. I know when I type it in the computer, spell check comes up and tells me there's no such word, but there is. It's in all the books, uh, but it's fleam. So now that we had talked about, you know, configurations of teeth and how saws cut, and we'd seen a lot of different kind of oddity saws and more of the workhorse saws, we began to talk about how to select a saw for your work and what are the elements of the saw that is going to make it good for you. We certainly talked about hang, and if you were to grab a saw and, and hold it out at, um, you know, stick it straight out to the side of your body, uh, parallel to the floor, how does it hang in your hand, and, and what, is it, what does it feel like? What is the weight like? Pay close attention to the handle and how that feels in your hand. And then we began to talk about something that I hadn't really heard before, and that's thrust pattern. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get any footage of this, but um, uh, maybe I'll show some demos in my shop later on. But essentially, take, that, take a distant D8, hold it straight out to the side of your body, parallel to the floor, and the tooth line will be parallel to the floor. Holding it like you were gonna like you were gonna cut it, you'll find that that tooth pattern is in line with your arm. But say take an Atkins saw made prior to World War II and do the same thing. Hold it straight out to the side of your body. You'll notice that the thrust pattern goes up at an angle, starting the lowest point at the heel and shooting up at an angle towards the toe. So really what you're looking at, as you're cutting into the saw, you're driving more steel into the wood the further you go down into the cut. Like the, the tooth line is actually angled and it can be an extremely aggressive cut. Now granted, it can be really, really hard to push that through, but thrust pattern is something to look at as well. If you're doing rough work or working in soft wood, maybe an aggressive thrust pattern can be in a way to cut a lot faster. Whereas if you want a finer, more refined cut, maybe dial back on that thrust pattern and go to that standard distant D8 or D12. Let's take a look at his saw bench real quick. This is a saw bench of somebody who does a lot of hand sawing. It's massive, it's beefy, and it's functional. So then we really wrapped up the seminar by making some cuts and, and talking about how they work, best ways to work through wood, a little bit of sawing technique, keeping your eye over the blade. Um, and, and actually, my compliments to my friend Bob Rozeski over at Logan Cabinet Shop because everything that Ron Herman said we should do as far as good technique, Bob demonstrated in his own sawing technique podcast. So if you haven't seen it yet, head over to the Logan Cabinet Shop uh, Weebly com, I believe it is, or Hand Tools and Techniques podcast on um, on YouTube, you can subscribe to. There's a great episode on sawing technique, and it's exactly what Ron told us. So kudos, Bob. So then I went down and stopped in on the hands-on um, clinic down in the marketplace. Uh, I believe it was the following morning, and Ron basically started out by talking about where he gets his saws, how he restores his saws. And then there's an interesting clip I'll show you in a bit about how he goes about filling in the rust pitting over time. From there, we broke up. Uh, you were able to pick and choose from his nest of saws and get to work. And he had himself and he had a couple other people that really would just kind of come around and say, try this or try that or what are you struggling with? And um, I unfortunately did not, was not able to kind of get hands on in anything because I was trying to do my good uh, reporter technique and get over across the hall to catch um, Adam Carabini's hands on class. So, but I got some really, really good techniques and things to look at. And, you know, more than anything, uh, I got some time to talk with Ron. And he is the type of guy that, you know, like we've said about these woodworking luminaries, very accessible. He said, if you've got any questions at all, drop me a line, send me an email, and we'll, uh, we'll answer it for you.
So really good experience, and I'm glad I met somebody I'd never met before in the woodworking world. And as I sprayed again before, because we always keep a spray can of lacquer on the job, and uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm not a liar. This is death. Spray lacquer, faster on spray lacquer. Every time I spray this again, I fill those pits. I fill the pits, and eventually the pits get filled to the top with lacquer, all the way to the top. It's not that I'm peeling the steel, but as I'm going back and forth in the wood, there's nothing catching. There's no little vacuum. There's no dirt being packed into that. So eventually, the saw gets to the point where you close your eyes and rub it. You don't feel the pit. And we use the saws enough, it, it heals it off. After a good hard day, we're out working. It's raining. Everything gets wiped down. Uh, we use basically a, a, an orange wax to wipe down. And they get used. If they're bare, they get hit with lacquer. Now, if it's got wax on it, hit with lacquer, who cares? It doesn't go anywhere. But the, your hands and the moisture, you stuff, you've got to keep the moisture off of it.